Ah, right, good morning. Okay. So, um, I want to take a slight journey to explore this alternative view, uh, move slow and mend things. Um, we're always move fast and break things is very much uh, sort of an old engineering adage, and it was popularized in recent years uh, by Facebook, but it's not their adage, but they've made it kind of popular. And, and I think that perhaps we get a little bit obsessed by a few things. So some of the things we get obsessed by is this kind of sense of haste, um, trying to get things done really, really quickly without necessarily caring about what we're doing. And so this is actually um, something that happened a few months ago. I was talking to one guy. You know, I can't get this code working, he said. Did you check it before integrating? Yes, I checked it in the interpreter. Did it work there? No. And this was a pattern of his. In other words, there's a kind of a somewhere... There is a deep faith, a deep optimism within every developer. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep developing. It's just like, well, you know what? It didn't work on my machine. You know that one? It's the opposite of it. Well, it worked on my machine. Well, it didn't work on my machine. So there is entirely the possibility that it will work in the production environment. <laughs> so let's try that. There's, you know, against all probabilities, there is this optimism. And you have to be an optimist to be a developer. Okay, you can't be a realist because you wouldn't do it. And, and part of this comes down to this kind of, this obsession that we have with speed. People are always talking about speed. And I want to talk about speed of performance. I mean, I really wish people would pay a little more attention to the performance of various uh, uh, applications and bits of software. Um, I, I'm always impressed that uh, how slow software can run given how fast hardware can. That's what software is for. It's for slowing the hardware down. Okay, that, that's, what, well, that's what we do. But we have this obsession with speed. It's in our language all over the place. And I don't think I really appreciated that um, until, until the early 90s, actually, when people started talking about rapid application development. So this is a pre-agile thing. It's very much based on prototyping, rapid application development. And unfortunately, because the focus was so much on being rapid, being fast, that you ended up with rapid application development. People just produce crap at high speed. Um, and you know, that hasn't really changed uh, uh, to, to, to a great extent. And people use words like productivity and so on. These are all language, this is all the language of speed or velocity. And actually, in, in the agile space, we often find people talking an awful lot about velocity. You know, what's the, uh, the sprint velocity? What is the team velocity? And actually, what is interesting is I really wish that people would talk about velocity because velocity and speed are not the same thing. Um, you know, in, in casual language, they may be, but velocity is a vector quantity. Okay? Velocity deals with the idea that there is not simply magnitude, which is speed, but there is direction as well. And that's the problem, is a lot of teams, when they're talking about velocity, are actually talking about speed. We're going, we're going really fast. You know, we're, we're, burning down the, we're burning down the backlog. Uh, we are setting fire to the story points. We are just running through everything. High speed. Yeah, but you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I know, but we're doing it really fast. <laughs> and, and that's the problem, is that what you have is this idea that a sense of direction. And what do we mean by direction in something as abstract as software development? Well. Are we doing good things with the code, or are we just produce? Are we just running up technical debt as we burn down the backlog? Are we actually addressing what the customer and do we really understand the customer? Because when you start using the term "the customer," for me, that's a watchword. That's a that's a sign that you don't understand the customer because there's no such thing as the customer. There is a company that wants something. And they are not a person, they're a set of people. So although we use humanizing language like the customer, only in a few cases do we ever deal with one individual who actually is the person who wants the software, who uses the software, and everything. Normally, the customer is basically a corporate entity of some kind. There are end users, there are people who sign off budgets, there are, there's a very complex thing. Basically, 
organizations are made of people. It's kind of like a socially acceptable form of Soylent Green. Um, and that's the, that's the th that problem, because what are you actually doing? Because somebody may say, we want this, but it turns out what the end, user, the end users need is something else. So velocity is heading in the right direction, and sometimes you have to find your way and kind of feel your way there. So we end up with this problem of focusing on speed as just the magnitude. And we, we reduce it to a very simple one-dimensional thing. Whether we are looking at things in progress on a Kanban chart, uh, whether we are counting story points, um, it's, a, it's a naive view. And unfortunately, we end up optimizing for the wrong measure. So there's this question of displacement and time. That's what we end up with, displacement and time. How far have we traveled in what time? And there is a, a problem here that depending on how we choose to measure it, here's a fairly typical kind of idea of um, what a burn down may look. So, so here I'm going to change S to mean, from the regular physics representation of distance, I, I'm going to make S is going to mean something really technical. I'm going to make it mean stuff. Okay? This is software functionality. This is stuff. These are S is for stories. It's whatever it is that you're measuring this stuff in. It's in scenarios and whatever. And the kind of idealized burn down chart is you kind of, oh, yeah, this is what we're doing. You know, this is, we're heading towards the next release, or this is the end of the sprint. We're burning through it, and it all looks beautiful. And then you kind of ask a question, you know, what are we measuring S in? I mean, I know what to measure time in. I've got lots of choices for measuring time. But what do I measure S in? And so let's just switch this around a little bit. Because there is a problem with looking at this, burning down. Sometimes you need to focus on building up. What is it that you've actually created? Not so much what have we got left to do. That can be helpful, but what have we actually created? And then we start looking again. How, how, how are we measuring what we've created? And so, as I said, time is time. That's not a problem. But what are we measuring S in? Well, here's the curious thing. <coughs> when you talk to most people, what are they measuring the work that they have done in? How are they measuring their software? How are they measuring their velocity or speed. Well, most of the way they do it is they take their estimates or they take the time that they have spent. And, and this is a bit of a problem because if I estimate something in three days and then I'm done, then what I've done here is I'm actually measuring if the amount of work is measured in time, then what we're doing is we're measuring time versus time, which is actually not the same as measuring how much software have we produced, how much functionality have we produced. And time against time, is a measure of utilization. Okay, that's how much time am I actually spending working on software versus how much time am I having lunch or being stuck in meetings or whatever. So time versus time is actually not a very useful measure, but a lot of teams are measuring it. And there's another thing that it might measure. Quality of estimation. How good are your estimates? Yeah, again, that's not actually productivity. That's not actually how much software that is useful for somebody have we developed? How much good, how, how good is our code? No, what we've ended up doing is measuring utilization and quality of estimation, which is entirely not what people wanted. So there's a kind of a pseudoscience in a lot of project management, and unfortunately it's permeated even the agile space, um, which also adopts some pseudoscientific language. Uh, and so if we actually want to figure out how we're going to go in the right direction, I'm going to borrow uh, Boyd's um, OODA loop, and uh, Boyd was, uh, he's a US Air Force pilot who basically um, sort of categorized this thing, which we, we, we find was then used to, retra uh, to train um, uh, Air Force pilots, but also we found it creeping into business and in other walks of life. This is a very simple idea of observe, gather information, let's have a look at what's going on. Understand where you're at, orient yourself, okay? Develop a plan for action, carry out the plan. Now, one of the most important things I think is fascinating here is that when we normally think of fighter pilots and, uh, and uh, fighter craft, apart from the ridiculous price tag that such technology uh, has, uh, we normally think of speed. And yet, notice how much of this loop is not about being fast. Most of this loop is about slowing you down. Because it turns out you need to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing at great speed. And there's this orientation idea. Now, I'm going to rotate this round a little bit. 
just to realign it. So we're going to decide, act, observe, orient. And that actually maps nicely onto something else that has uh, uh, permeated uh, business speak, um, the lean space, the agile space, plan, do, study, act. Sometimes it's called check, act, plan, do, check, act, PDCA. I prefer the word study, the original um, deming Shuart formulation, because it sounds slow. Check is, you know, is that okay? Yeah, checked. Study sounds like it's going to take time. Yeah? And I notice this with my kids, because my older one's doing exams this year, and it's a case of, you know, have you studied? Have you checked your answers? That doesn't take very long, but have you studied the subject? That's slow. And this is important. We need to use the language that suggests that maybe we need to slow down a little bit. It turns out that this kind of thinking about what you're doing is really important. And this whole thinking thing is something that eludes many developers. So what we've got here is what we call an empirical cycle. I've got a hypothesis. I'm going to do something. Then I'm going to observe what I've got. And then I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do next. And this is the very basis of engineering. Now, it happens that this year is the 20th anniversary. 20th? No, 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 no. Uh, 50th anniversary, half a century ago, of the Software Engineering Conference, the NATO Software Engineering Conference in Garmisch, um, which is a widely misunderstood conference. It was not actually the origin of the term software engineering. The term software engineering, as far as we can make out, uh, dates to Margaret Hamilton. Um, she was responsible for uh, leading a team that developed um, uh, much of the software for the Apollo space program. Uh, and she used the term software engineering uh, to try and show the parallels with other forms of engineering, hardware engineering, and so on. Um, and this term was kind of current in the 60s, uh, mid-60s, but they thought, okay, let's, let's have a look at this. Let's actually explore what do we mean uh, by this stuff. Now, a lot of people have gone on to say, well, this conference, you know, it set us down the path of plan-driven development. It sent us down the path of waterfall development and all kinds of stuff. I recently reread it. I recently reread the proceedings, and what I found was there was a diversity of thinking there that is definitely not the kind of the plan-driven, simplistic notion. And there's a lot of really interesting quotes, and the one relevant directly here from Andy Kinslow is, the design process is an iterative one. So this is how you thought about design in 1968. Something happened in the 1970s, which we've only just got back in the 21st century. The design process is an iterative one. In other words, you're going to plan, do, study out. You're going to converge on the right thing. You're going to start out saying, we think this is a hypothesis. And we've ended up with this fake language um, of uh, commitment. We're going to commit to doing this. Our architecture is a commitment. This is the architecture. Architecture is a hypothesis. Your code base is a hypothesis. This is how we believe that it should be. The running software, that's a hypothesis. I wonder if the customer likes it. Does this actually solve a problem? Does it even work? That's a kind of an interesting hypothesis. Should we test it? No, 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 we're just going to believe in it. No, I think we should test it. So there's a, uh, one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman. He has this lovely piece of advice, and this is for the creative arts. And this is exactly true of software as well. This is, software is a creative art as well as being an engineering form. You have to finish things. That's what you learn from. You learn by finishing things. If somebody says, we have a year to do this, no, you don't. You have lots of months, you have lots of weeks. Finish something, always be finishing. Always find yourself at a point where you finished it and then stop. This is the bit people find hard because it's the opposite of velocity, it's always the opposite of speed. Stop, look at what you built and go, well, that went well. We should do more of this. Well, that didn't go well. What, you mean using yet another JavaScript framework that was invented over the weekend by somebody? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, I think it's going to be the best. Yeah, but we're already using 20 different JavaScript frameworks. You know, this is like, it's, that's not the thing to optimize for. How many JavaScript frameworks did you use and discard through the process? How many mocking frameworks are you using? Oh, I think we might be near 23. Yeah. No, that is not the thing to optimize for. So there's this whole idea of like, pause, have a look and go, you know, that's working out really well. Or that's not working out so well. Should we change things? No, no, let's just keep going really fast in the wrong direction. This is what you do. It also involves reacting to the situation. It's really funny that refactoring as a term, it's, it's taken so long to be understood and misunderstood. 
the idea that design is not a design is is a process of formulating a hypothesis doing something and then looking back and then acting on that and we lacked a name for the bit that comes after and so people say there's design and refactoring no refactoring is continuous design it's the looking at the thing and go oh you know what we can change that we understand more and the term dates back um the term dates back about 30 years to bill opdyke and uh, just for those of you who are interested um uh, there's a new edition of refactoring that's going to be coming out at some point. Martin, Martin Fowler's working on it. Um, uh, it's going to be in JavaScript, so I don't know how you feel about that. I know how I feel about that. But, but here's the thing. When people talk about refactoring, they normally think about code. And when we talk about technical debt, we normally talk about code. When we talk about the things that you care for, and when we talk about development principles, we talk about the code. And the problem is, we have a very narrow view of the code. If you're a Java programmer, you're thinking, this is my Java. Okay? If you maybe think a little bit more, you know, oh, I'm going to try a few other things. We've got some Kotlin in our code base. Yeah, we're, we're cool. You're still thinking it's the Kotlin, it's the Java, it's the whatever. How many, is there such a thing as a 100%? Do you remember a few years ago, we got very excited about 100% Java as an idea. Every 100% Java system I ever looked at had loads of XML. It was not 100% Java. It was like American coffee. It was just diluted, okay? <laughs> it was just, you know, it's just like, well, what is this extra crap? No, I don't want a liter of homeopathic water with a trace of caffeine in it. And that was what most enterprise systems were. They're kind of like, yeah, we've got some Java glued together with loads of XML, but we're going to focus on the Java as being the source of our concerns, our quality, and our refactoring. It's like, no, we're talking about everything. We're talking about the tests. When you refactor and revisit, we're talking about the test, we're talking about the scripts, we're talking about all of these things, the configuration. These are all language, these are all program. Yeah, your configuration is part of your program, not something else. We'll see an example of that later. There's another way of looking at this as well. Quite literally, let's look at, let's look at code from a different point of view. Let's look at the, the idea that what you're looking at is codified knowledge. Now, there are many different ways that people try to reason about code, and I think that's very helpful because it's a very abstract concept. Um, what do we mean by it? Is it, is it, a, is it an engineering plan? Uh, is it a formal specification? Is it an instruction to the machine? Is it a mathematical construct? At some level or other, many of these have a truth, and some are more useful than others. I want to give you the idea that what you're doing when you work on a code base is you're codifying knowledge. It's a representation of your learning. What you're doing is individually or more likely collectively, you are trying to learn. How do we build this system? You are learning about the technical decisions. You are learning about the domain in which you're working. And that domain may change, as indeed may the technology. It's a constant state of learning. So it's codified knowledge. It's a representation. Effectively, it's kind of a, it's a, a Wikipedia of this is how we believe the system should be built. So therefore, we can say that software development itself is a process of knowledge acquisition. Now, I'm just going to make another point here. Knowledge acquisition is a brilliant phrase. Use it when you are talking to your managers. So uh, tell us about your development practices and your development process. Ah, well, we use a knowledge acquisition model for our process. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Uh, knowledge acquisition is just a fancy way of saying learning. That is what you are doing. You are learning. And it is an ongoing process. This is the main thing about software development, is that most of what you are creating has not been created before. This is a really key idea. Because... You know what we do if somebody says, we need a system that does exactly what that system over there does. We give them that system over there. It's a, it's a solved problem in software. You know, if my son says, uh, if one of my sons says, hey, you know, dad, I found this really good app. I don't sit there and go, oh, we're going to have to make it bit by bit. I download it. In other words, manufacturing is a solved problem in software. If you want copies of the same thing, then you, you, you get the same thing. That's it, we're done. Whereas in the real world, to create, a second, uh, to create another instance of something requires logistical work. It requires the movement of materials. We don't have to do that in software. If you go to a restaurant and you say, 
And they say, well, what would you like? I want to have what she's having. They don't go over to her table and steal it. That's rude. They have to go through a logistical process. They go to the kitchen. They have an order. These things take time, materials, and effort. They try and produce an identical thing. In software, this is a solved problem. We solved it in the 1950s. Okay? Software development is not manufacturing. It never was. It never is. It is all about the question of what are we trying to build and how shall we build it. And these questions, if you're trying to build something new, even if somebody says, hey, look, that C-sharp system, that .NET system, we want to rebuild that in, J in a JVM environment, they're not asking for the same thing. They're asking for something different. Because if it were the same thing, we'd just copy it. They're asking for something different. If people say, we want that but slightly different, they're not asking for the same thing. So software development is all about the not the creation of identical artifacts, it is about the creation of differentiation, which means that somebody's asking for something that they may not have thought of or you may not be aware of. So it's always something new, you are always learning. So if learning is the main backbone of this, then that means how do we do this? We communicate. Communication is really important. Code is a form of communication. I'm still, uh, you know, code is a form of communication. Standing by the coffee machine is a form of communication. It's still an open question as to whether or not Slack is a form of communication. It's definitely a form of something, but we're not sure yet. We'll get back to you. Um, but it also tells you that your architecture and everything, it's about social negotiation. Why do we care about coding standards? Why do we care about coding guidelines? Why do we care about how the architecture, or this is how we do things in this system? Mostly it's social negotiation. It's not for individual benefit. Primarily, it's for social negotiation. It's so that it turns out that you can live with your colleagues. You know, this is, it, it's kind of like this very simple idea. We do this, we do this like this. It makes it easier. Yeah? We choose this language. We choose these conventions. Or in this part of the system, we use these frameworks and these languages. In this part, we use different languages and conventions. But there's an idea of it's social negotiation, which means, again, that's in flux. But it also means that what your architecture is, is not merely a technical construct, it's a model of participation. It shows you, as a building architecture would, how people are going to live together and work together. Now, all of this gives this idea, I was asked this question uh, in an interview um, for Jax London last year. The biggest advantage of, I was asked, what are the biggest advantages of autonomously working teams? And I said, well, the biggest advantage is risk reduction through increased group intelligence. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to be smarter collectively. Now, it turns out that intelligence is a very slippery concept, and people keep worrying about artificial intelligence these days. We're not even sure what natural intelligence is. But it turns out there are ways to increase and decrease natural intelligence. And this uh, observation um, we, we see in a number of cases. Um, there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. So a friend of mine ran a company a few years ago and he got some really smart people in. It was not good. Okay. They were all really clever. But it was a little bit like the England football team. They're all really skilled individually. They're all really well paid individually. They can't play as a team at all. It's, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, 2016, England was beaten 2-1 by Iceland. So, you know, Iceland. I think most of the, you know, most of the Icelandic team were kind of, uh, you know, they, they did football in their spare time. You know, Iceland, has a po I live in Bristol. Iceland's population is smaller than Bristol. We have two football teams in Bristol. What was, what was the big secret to Iceland's skill? Well, they played as a team. Their collective skill, that's what matters. A bunch of individuals, you know what? And so there is this interesting question of just having smart people. And, if you sp and this is this problem that we often end up with again in our quest for speed. Let's get more smart people or let's get people with these particular skills. It turns out that team playing is a very abstract skill or being able to work with other people or help. It's really difficult. And the interesting thing about this research, if a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. Okay? I'm, going, I'm looking out at you and I can say, collectively, you could be smarter. Okay? <laughs> but there's a point here. It goes back to the diversity. There's this classic idea. If you're all thinking the same, then you're not thinking. If you end up with a team that has got the same demographic background, 
The same kinds of degrees, the same kinds of uh, ethnic background, the same kinds of education, the same kinds of age, all of this stuff. It's just like, yeah, this is not actually going to be that helpful. What you need is, I don't mean you should get complete psychos on your team, because that will certainly change the intellectual diversity of your team. But I'm saying that the idea that everybody should think the same way and have the same background, they're all drawing from the same source. So James Sirowicki, in 2003, published this book, The Wisdom of Crowds, Why the Many Are Smarter Than the Few. Now, that we do have this problem. He, there is this idea, how do you get people to be collectively smart? Because we also recognize that people can be collectively stupid. I'm from the UK. We know this. We have a big experiment <laughs> that's ongoing. It is one of the, it's the w largest experiment in social stupidity the world has ever seen. Watch closely. People will be writing papers about this for decades to come. So how do you get a group of people to act rather than dumber? How do you get them to act smarter? Um, and there's this um, four conditions, these four conditions that uh, James Sirocchi uh, outlined. The four conditions that characterize wise crowds, diversity of opinion, okay? We've already covered that one. Independence. You are able to think separately. You're in a position where you can draw your own conclusions. And importantly, decentralization, you are drawing from different sources. You're not all using the same things. You're not all thinking the same way. You haven't all had the same educational background, read all the same books, and so on. You, there's this idea, and you're not, and you're able, this idea of being able to think independently. In other words, this is also a question about what is the role of leadership versus management? This idea of being able to have people just try stuff out, experiment. Oh, that sounds like it's slow. Well, yeah, because the goal here is not to move fast. The goal here is to move in the right direction. And this idea is that what you're trying to do is try to explore the space. And exploration means you don't travel necessarily in a straight line, even though you're over, you know, you can explore over here, you can explore over there. Let's try that. Yeah, let's try that. And then if that works out, that's brilliant. And if it doesn't, well, that's cool. We know. But there's another thing, aggregation. Aggregation means we need to bring it all together. Having people going off in different directions is really, that's not going to help you ultimately. You need to bring them back together. How do you bring people back together? That's your software architecture. That's your, uh, that's your socializing, however you socialize. This is all of the stuff. Your architecture is a model of participation. It tries to help people bring, uh, uh, bring them back together again. So. What else goes with speed in the obsession that we have? When people talk about speed, often they're saying, well, we need to go faster. Why? Well, we're, we're bigger. And people end up using the word scale at some point. We need to scale what we're doing. We need to scale our development. Now, there's an interesting thing, um, and I know this because my older son does CrossFit, and there is terminology in CrossFit um, if you have a different level of fitness and you're trying to do a particular uh, workout, <coughs> if you have a different level of fitness, which is a polite way of saying less fitness than some of the other people, then what you do is you scale the practice. But the use of the word scale in CrossFit means you scale down. Because when people say we need to scale our development, there is an open question that we forget to ask. Next time you hear that phrase, somebody says we need to scale our development, always ask them, up or down? Because there is this assumption that the word scale means up. And it was CrossFit that reminded me, it's like, no, they're scaling down as well. Perhaps you are moving in the wrong direction. It is entirely possible. You are correct. Scale is a question, but not the way you think it is. So, yeah, I've got this nice, nice picture. It turns out that if you are trying to actually transport goods, oil, stuff like that, those are quite useful. If you're trying to go on a fishing trip, I'm going to go with these guys here. Turns out that the thing on the left, oh yeah, I know, but it's going to be big fishing. Yeah, it's not going to work. And so this idea, there's, a, there's this idea, this pervasive myth that Alan Kelly, a friend of mine, pointed out in Beyond Projects, uh, a talk uh, where he focused on this idea, software development does not have economies of scale. We are so used to the idea of the economics of scale. The idea that if I... If I, well, it's, we, we, we see this um, very much. If you, buy glass, if you buy wine by the glass, it will be more expensive per volume than buying it by the bottle. Okay? The economies of scale, buy bottles if you're going to drink that much. Okay? And so we have this idea of like, well, maybe we, we get better, better scaling. Let's, let's add more people. We get economies of scale. No, you get economies of scale with manufacturing. 
But it turns out that software development is not manufacturing. We have the opposite, diseconomies of scale, because what you're trying to do is collectively collaborate. You're trying to get people's intelligence working together. It turns out that the more people you have, the harder that gets. It's not that it's impossible, it's just that you need to keep that in mind. Doubling the number of people does not halve, uh, you know, halve your problems, it, uh, it quadruples them. So let's, let's a simple thought experiment, we can run through this. Um, so here is the time taken for one person to complete some software development. And by that, I mean everything. If we're talking about dealing with deployment, that's them. System testing, that's them. Gathering the requirements, that's them. Okay, all of the stuff, the code, everything. That's the time taken for one person. Okay, so then we say division of labor. Um, the economics of scaling. Let's get two people on this. No, let's get three. What about four? Four, it'll go four times faster. Brilliant. And then... And now, do you ever remember, uh, I remember at school, one of the most amazing things at school was when we learnt electronics, my younger son's just started learning electronics, when we learnt electronics, at school we had idealised wires. I remember the diagrams, it's like, don't worry about the resistance of the wires, imagine it's zero. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, you're a teenager and you're already dealing with superconducting materials. That's pretty cool. Disappointingly, what we actually used in the lab was resistive. <laughs> so it turns out that this is like superconducting wires. This is an idealization, just to keep things simple. What happens when you get people organized in a group? Well, they need to, sometimes they need to wait for each other, which leads to this. P is the portion you can do in parallel. Basically, we're now, this is a byproduct of the process as well as the architecture. Who needs to wait on who? If we have highly specialized roles, well, I'm waiting on the BA, systems testers waiting on somebody else, that person's waiting, you know, oh, we're all waiting on the DBA. And that, uh, if you overly specialize, you introduce wait states, you reduce the parallelism, you have handoffs. We actually know this because this is called Amdahl's law. We normally apply it to processes. Which, again, this also helps me highlight that this is an idealization. Okay, I'm just this is a simple thought experiment. Developers are not that easily characterized. Um, just quickly read the commit strip comics, and you'll understand. Um, but we're not done yet. You can see the space to the right. Oh, that's much more like it. You know, how many bracket levels can we get? Okay. It turns out that if you're going to, we, we haven't even talked about the proper coordination question. You need to talk to other people. And in the worst case, that's going to be quadratic. And this is actually dictated by your architecture. Your architecture and your development process, these are all going to influence who needs to talk to who. Does everybody need to talk to everybody else? Are we always permanently in meetings? There's this idea, oh, communication is good. Yeah, up to a point. Because you can easily debunk that idea. If we don't communicate, that's clearly a problem. So then we fall into this very simple idea of like, well, some communication is a good idea, more communication is better, 100% communication is obviously the best. We're permanently in meetings and nobody is writing any code. <laughs> ah, not bad, there's no bugs. <laughs> so clearly it does not follow a straight line. And, different, and, and there will be some kind of communication overhead, typical, you know, whatever. So we have this. So what's the curve look like? It looks like this. What we end up with is this problem of, well, the benefit, here's the intuitive, uh, intuitive bit. If you have zero people, there's no bugs as well. It takes infinite time to develop. As you start adding people, things start speeding up. Things start getting better. Then you reach an optimal point, and then you start adding more people, and it starts slowing down. Most consultancies seem to operate over here. And then we end up with very poor experience, and we sort of say, you know what, that project that we had last year with 20 people, that didn't work out quite so well. We should put 30 on for this one. No, no, you're heading in the wrong direction. Obviously, it isn't smooth. That's why we can't tell it very easily. Uh, it's an idealization. But nonetheless, there is this, uh, this case. There are far too many examples in the published literature and also personal experience where I've seen people being added. We have the classic idea that adding more people to a late project makes it later. That's Brooks' law. But there's this simple idea that actually, how do you make it late in the first place? This is a magnificent technique for doing that. Let's add more people. It turns out that beyond a particular point, 
the number of people, the cost, and all the rest of, it of development are nothing to do with the functionality. Now, one of my favorite examples um, comes from uh, this one. Uh, a few years ago, as part of uh, the security theater in the US, uh, the TSA had um, this idea. They commissioned an application. They commissioned an application. The guards at airports had a new weapon. They'd, they'd stand there with tablets, and they'd randomly direct travelers. So this is a complete waste of a human being, okay? You're standing there with a tablet, and it points left or right, and you tap the screen, so it randomly shuffles the queue, okay? Um, they spent nearly 50,000 US dollars developing this and another quarter of a million dollars deploying it. And one of my favorite things is there's a guy who did this on, uh, who recreated this in Android in less than 10 minutes. Uh, on a YouTube video, and quite frankly, he was just messing about. You know, if he'd really wanted to, he could have done it in five minutes, okay? And you're looking at that, going like, what? And, uh, you know, just for a bit of fun, I decided one day, I thought, I wonder if you can do it even, he, he did it as an Android app, I, wonder, I saw, thought, I wonder if you can just do this in, in HTML. So, yeah, okay. Uh, did, uh, right, okay, so that's, uh, that's randomized our left arrow and right arrow. There you go. Let's do that on load, on click, there's the script. Uh, a little bit of styling, and because we keep referring to the body, I feel I'm going to make it complete. And you know, y and you end up with you know something that you can actually put in a single slide. And yeah, there you go. So there it is. So so I showed this to my kids, and they said, and they said, so Dad, that's worth fifty thousand dollars, is it? <laughs> I said, apparently it is. Yeah. And my children don't yet understand. They said, Dad, why are you giving it away for free? <laughs> I said, no, 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 this is already a dead thing. Now, the key point here is this is, a, this is something I started saying in the, the late 20th century. And uh, Sebastian Hermida picked it up a few years ago and did this lovely uh, um, a graphic of it. Typing is not the bottleneck in software development. We often have this obsession of trying to talk. We get it with code generation. People are obsessed with the idea that Typing is the problem, and it's not, it's not, it's not the problem. It, typing is, is not the bit that we struggle with. And code generation sometimes solves the right problem, but in so many cases, it compensates for poor frameworks um, and, and weak abstractions and problems that we should be able to solve in different ways. So let's go back to this kind of core question of uh, move fast and break things. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? So I was asked this question. And as with many binary options, it's a false choice. It's a context-specific thing. When, you apply, when applied with an appropriate context, it can be considered a good thing, an invitation to experiment. We've talked about experimentation freely. The idea of move fast and break things, let's try things out. That's a good thing, yeah? Because we can't know everything in advance. And software development is a learning exercise. And you need an active approach to exploration, hypothesis formulation, and so on. An invitation to experiment freely and without restraint to discover new ways of working and thinking to break out of an overly comfortable or stuck place. Brilliant. The problem is, on the other hand, when applied outside the appropriate context, it can undermine people and their work. It can come across as irresponsible, arrogant, and lacking in self-awareness. And this is a bad thing. Moving fast and breaking things, your customer probably won't appreciate that in the production environment. Okay? But also, there are, it goes way beyond this very simple idea of things. So let's, let's go back to the popularizers of this, recent popularizers of this phrase, Facebook. And let's do a little bit of time travel here. See, for whatever reason, I decided I'd give Facebook some feedback on something. Your feedback will be used to improve Facebook, not that I've noticed. Thanks for taking the time, the time, the time, 31st of December 1969. That's an impressive piece of time travel there. I didn't think Facebook was that old. I mean, I wasn't doing an awful lot around then, but, you know, at least I existed. Mark Zuckerberg certainly didn't. What happened? Well, we've got a negative number. Oh, okay, this is a 32-bit. Oh, this is time T. We've got a, nu we've got a wrap around. Oh, this is a simple bug. Hmm. Now, how simple can you make bugs? Well, it's got to the point, I collect these bugs, people... I used to collect these bugs. I used to take photographs and screenshots and stuff like that. People, I, I don't need to bother anymore. People now send them to me. My, my Twitter stream, people just sort of say, hey, look, and I retweet. Uh, here we go. And what, this is the important thing. What we see, 
we say well, is, is that people are, what happens when a software system breaks? What it does is it loses all its encapsulation. It doesn't matter what your experience was, this is an app, this is a web page. Suddenly when the whole thing breaks, it, you see how it's built. It fractures along its fault lines. So here we go, this is the underlying address model uh, of something, um, uh, uh, a sort of logistics company in Canada, and there we go, it's, P, uh, it's PHP. Um, so yeah, okay, we can see that. And it's actually got to the point where I retweet so often that somebody decided to call them a Kevlin Henny. So this is the uh, inception moment uh, uh, last year at Tackline said, arriving in Bologna, I saw a Kevlin Henny screen. So I'm now an adjective. And somebody did ask me, how does it, so, <laughs> so how does it feel to be associated with failure, Kevlin? It's, you know, have your name, it's, uh, yeah, mixed. Um, and, and this has now got to uh, some ridiculous proportions. Um, a year and a half ago, I was at Agile in the City uh, conference in Bristol, and the organizer, John Clapham, said, quick, Kevlin, come downstairs. There's, there's a Kevlin Henny screen, and I want to take a picture of you in it, and then you can retweet it. <laughs> and I was also at Agile in the City just this last November, where we decided to do this. <laughs> and I used that slide in Devternity uh, in uh, Riga in uh, uh, December. And yeah, so we're now getting this kind of inception kind of thing going. Now, this is all good fun, but sometimes these failures can be a little more costly. The Schiaparelli uh, probe, it was due to land on Mars uh, October 2016. Actually, it did, just slightly faster than they planned. And, you know, they, 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 little bits and pieces, uh, a little error. It was a software error. The IMU went, uh, went about its business calculating the lander's rotation rate for some reason, and it turns out that there was a, a value that incremented but never got reset. Oops. Uh, the IMU calculated a saturation maximum period that persisted for one second longer than would normally be experienced at this stage. When this was sent, the craft's navigation system calculated a negative altitude. In other words, below ground. At which point, it's, uh, you know, at which point all kinds of hell broke loose. So the actual anomaly, I love, I love space travel. They use such great euphemisms. It's like we talk about it as a crash, a disaster. It's an anomaly. Feel free to use that in your development environment. And they worked out that what happened is that they, this had accumulated and the, uh, the craft had calculated that it had flipped over. But that nobody would ever check the idea that it should be over 90 degrees, or in fact it was 169 degrees if I remember correctly. And it turns out the cosine of 169 degrees is negative and, you know, and therefore the craft decides, okay, lose the back shell, drop the parachute, do all the rest of it. The only problem is, you're nearly 4K above the ground, and it's, well, you can actually see the crash site from orbit. They have photographs. Now, what is the key thing here? The key thing here is slow down. Now, this is, um, we understand this. It turns out that we know how to solve this. It turns out that testing is kind of useful. This is a very interesting study done on a bunch of distributed systems. Their observations, almost all the catastrophic failures are a result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors. We can actually model these, we can capture these. 77% of them could be reproduced using unit tests. That doesn't mean that you can find them all in advance, but it does mean that you can nail them down afterwards and say, yep, this is unit testable, we can do something about this. Which kind of leads me to sort of a conclusion. This is a book I edited a few years ago. Um, we're now, me and O'Reilly are now uh, kicking off. We're going to be working on 97 things every Java programmer should know in the near future. And there was a lovely observation in it from Neil Ford. Testing is the engineering rigor of software development. That's kind of where we're going. And when you talk to a lot of people, what they complain about is, oh, you know, testing, that slows me down. But if you've been listening carefully, the one thing you may have picked up is that Testing is all about slowing us down. That is the whole point. Um, the idea, if we go back to software engineering, another quote from this report, a software uh, a system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. So this is 1968 wisdom. Testing should be all the way through the development. Okay? It should not, it's not a thing to be done at the end or forgotten about, or even the most popular option, outsource it to the customer. It's a thing that is part of the development. And if people complain that it slows them down, then that's a really good thing. Because what it'll do is it'll let, it'll let you focus more on the velocity and not the speed. So 
whilst this does have some value in particular contexts, this is the real message. And ultimately, the driver of the software development is you. And that's what this is all about. Thank you very much.